Today, we're taking a look at the de Havilland DH-72, sometimes known unofficially as the de Havilland Canberra. In the late 1920s, the British Air Ministry was contemplating the idea of a heavy bomber, something that was at odds with the current climate of financial austerity and the Ministry's own treatment of strategic aircraft up until this point. Light and medium bombers were preferred, but rumours of super-heavy experimental designs being developed by France and Italy prompted a sudden change of tune. Indeed, the large designs being produced by Giovanni Caproni in particular was a real cause for concern. Specification B19-27 was drawn up in response to this, and this would eventually lead to the Ferry Hendon and the Handley Page Hayford, both of which we've already covered on this channel. But not too long after that specification was issued, somebody appears to have raised the question of aero engine power, and specifically engine redundancy. At the time, with the limited power of engines, no twin-engine bomber in service could stay airborne under the power of just one engine alone. There were two solutions, develop better engines, or look at designs that merely had more. More powerful engines were in development, but their associated cost made them unappealing for use in military aircraft at this time, probably because any increase in cost was unappealing in general, and so the Air Ministry drew up a specification that looked at a three-engine design, specifically with the Bristol Jupiter engine in mind. Specification B22-27 seemed to be almost identical to 19-27, with the exception of the number of engines allowed and their type. A range of approximately 920 miles, or 1,480 kilometers, was expected. Cruising speed and altitude was to be 115 miles an hour, or 185 kilometers an hour, at 10,000 feet, 3,048 meters. And the standard military load, including crew, bombs, and guns, was approximately 3,165 pounds, or 1,435 kilos. Unfortunately, the specification seemed to be compromised from the start, as the Air Ministry absolutely required the provision of a nose gunner. This meant that the third engine could not be in the nose. Well, it, it could, but do you really want a gunner that close to a heavy engine? And then you had to consider the poor field of fire, interrupter gears, etc. It just wasn't going to work and that left a high-mounted central wing engine as the only alternative, which meant that the centre of gravity and longitudinal stability of this bomber was already a bit, well, terrifying from the outset. Several tenders to this specification were received in late 1927, and it will come as no surprise that many came with notes from designers explaining the extreme difficulty they were having in meeting the specified requirements without either A. producing a flying death trap, or B. performing some Lovecraftian sacrifice to convince the eldritch gods of aerodynamics and physics to allow said aircraft to even work. As a result of the impossibility to meet the load and airframe strength requirements of the specification, the Air Ministry made several amendments. This did favour certain manufacturers who had experience in designing large aircraft, but none of them submitted actual submissions for this, and all but two of these submissions were eventually withdrawn, leaving just two designs from Bolton Paul and de Havilland both firms being quite inexperienced in building large aircraft. Of the two, de Havilland had a bit of a handicap when it came to producing their design, the DH-72. The company had relatively little experience in producing aircraft with metal structures, and they set about this design by taking their existing DH-66 Hercules and essentially scaling it up, along with slapping a third engine on along the way. The result was a massive three-bay biplane, with two engines on the lower wings and the third on the upper centre section. The fuselage was still predominantly constructed of wood, but as the huge wings spanned 95 feet and were required to have the strength to lift an aircraft weighing up to 20,000 pounds, their structure was made from metal. 
Additionally, they also had to fold to be able to accommodate most RAF hangars. Construction began at some point in 1928, with the aircraft being named the Canberra by de Havilland. This seemed to reflect the company policy of naming its commercial aircraft after various cities, but it is unclear as to whether this name was ever formally acknowledged by the Air Ministry. Unfortunately, this project did not get off to a good start. Very early on, it became clear that building the DH-72 was going to present a multitude of headaches for the design team. As construction progressed at Stag Lane, numerous complications arose with the engine mount of the central engine. The projected longitudinal and directional stability necessitated the experimental design of several different tail surfaces, and the eventual triple fin layout had controls that were so heavy that many wondered if it was even practicable. Then, further weight testing revealed that a four-wheel undercarriage would be required, and this raised further concerns about drag, takeoff performance, and ground handling. But all of these paled in comparison to the general challenge of actually building the thing. Construction dragged on, and on, and on with de Havilland's team constantly frustrated by the challenges of working with the complex metal framework of the wings. Eventually, after two years of slow progress, de Havilland requested to hand the prototype over to the Gloucester Aircraft Company to complete instead. The two had an ongoing agreement, where Gloucester helped de Havilland with their military projects, which freed up de Havilland to work on their civilian airliners, which they viewed to be far more financially lucrative. This request was approved by the Air Ministry, and Gloucester took over the DH-72 project, completing the prototype in the spring of 1931. In its final form, the DH-72 had reverted to a twin-fin tail unit, and it had a series of bomb racks installed along the underside of its long fuselage. Supposedly, it could carry up to 10 250-pound bombs, but documentation on this is scarce, and conclusions could only be drawn from the few photos of this bomber that could actually be found. It had a crew of either three or four, a pilot, a bomb aimer slash nose gunner, and a rear gunner. The disputed fourth crew member would have been a radio operator that sat in a cabin below the pilot. Due to the bomber's size and projected range, I believe this would have been the case. But again, finding documentation that confirms this has been almost impossible, so I can't say much more than that. Powered by 595 horsepower Bristol Jupiter XFS engines, it flew for the first time on the 27th of July 1931. Remarkably, no problems with stability or heavy controls were encountered during the initial flights, and the prototype went off to Farnborough for further testing in November of that year. Around this time, it also completed trials at Martlesham Heath, where it competed against the Bolton Paul P-32, which had followed a very similar design principle. Ironically, the DH-72, which had a troubled construction, encountered little problems during this time, aside from a single engine failure, whereas the Bolton Paul design suffered from stability and mechanical problems. In the end, neither would actually see a production order. Both were not really ideal designs from the outset, and the Air Ministry had shifted focus to medium bombers. This was in part due to simplicity and cost, and also due to the possibility of restrictions being placed on bomber designs by a proposed disarmament conference. In 1932, the heavy bomber requirement was officially dropped, and at some point not long after this, the DH-72 prototype was broken up for scrap. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you, of course, to the Patreon supporters. I will update all of these details upon my return next month.